Hello, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Kitchen Sink. My name is Irfan. I'm the chef at Badal, which is the Indian restaurant across campus. So I'd like everyone to welcome Josie Bates. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very flattering. Um, thank you for having me and everybody who's, who's welcomed me here. I feel very, very comfy, so that's really nice. Um, and yeah, it was funny. I was driving down. So I'm Josie Baker. Um, my business is Josie Baker Bread, and I'm co-owner of The Mill, which is a cafe bakery in San Francisco that uh, I co-own with Four Barrel Coffee. And that's where we, we bake all of our bread. But I got my start about five, a little over five years ago baking at home. And I just had a buddy who was traveling through San Francisco who had a sourdough starter with him. And I said, why do you have sourdough starter? You can't, I didn't really think you could bake good bread at home. He said, yeah, yeah, you can bake good bread. So he scribbled down some instructions. He gifted me a little bit of sourdough starter. And a few days later, I tried it and just completely fell in love with the process of baking bread. And the nice thing about the process of baking bread is the pr the product <laughs> is bread. <laughs> and bread is really nice to share with people. And um, but I, I loved baking so much that I just started doing it all the time. And again, you're left with bread after you <laughs> you, you, you go through the process of baking and um, Originally, I just started storing the extra loaves in my freezer. And then my roommate said, man, you can't store more bread in the freezer. So I said, OK, well, I, I don't know. I'm eating as much as I can. I start giving it away. And then one day, a friend says, I'll give you some money, because he was getting a lot of bread for me. <laughs> I'll give you a few bucks. And he said, oh, huh, sell the bread. <laughs> Good idea, Michael. Um, and that was sort of how it began. And um, funny enough, this, I didn't even do this on purpose, but this tub that this dough is in was one of the first pieces of baking equipment that I purchased. <laughs> and at, at the time, I was like, this is so huge. This can hold so much dough. And now at the mill, you know, we're doing 350 loaves a day or so. Um, but I drove down in my truck with it, and it felt, it felt like, like the good old days, because what, what I did is I started baking at home, and then uh, started selling it originally just to friends and neighbors, and then to strangers, and pretty quickly had to find a bigger space to make the bread. So I started renting space from, from other businesses. Um, from Mission Pie, which is a pie baker in the Mission, then Pizzaiolo, which is an Italian restaurant, California Italian restaurant in Oakland with a wood-fired oven. And um, was doing that all by myself. And then Jeremy Tooker, who's a founder, owner of Four Barrel Coffee, approached me and asked me if I wanted to do a project with him. And so we, we opened the mill. So that's me in a nutshell. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is I'm really excited. I've been uh, fermenting some ideas for uh, for a, a different type of presentation. I've done lots of you know how to make bread at home classes before, and I'm going to do that today. But I'm going to have kind of a new overlay to it, um, which I think are the the principles that make good bread. And so if you take these principles, you can really apply them to, to any style of bread, well, any, any grain, really, um, which at the mill, we have a stone mill in our bakery, and we're always doing lots of experimentation with different types of grain. And um, I sort of stepped back and looked at all of our breads and sort of uncovered these principles that were really at the heart of, of all of our breads, which are, they're sort of provocative, but <laughs> um, it's, actually wait, before I get to that. So what makes good bread? This is just my opinion. But uh, 
obviously, it tastes good, right? And so the types of bread that I'm interest, most interested in are um, pretty simple breads. They're breads that um, evoke the most flavor from the grain itself that the bread is made from. Not to say, I love, I love me a delicious sweet bread that's filled with butter and sugar and all, all types of, you know, uh, raisins and, and cheeses and all those things. It makes a delicious bread, but, but the, what's most interesting to me from, from the baking perspective is really trying to evoke all of the flavor from a grain itself. Um, so it tastes good. It's good for you, right? Bread is, um, it, it can be, I think it should be, the cornerstone of, of, a, of a healthy diet, um, which not all bread can fill that role. Um, and a loaf of bread should keep well. Yeah, you should be able to have it for, for a few days. Ideally, not because of a bunch of artificial preservatives that are pumped into it. Um, and made from uh, responsible, sustainable ingredients. Yeah. We all want to be, be good to this world we're a part of. Um, and so, how do we get all of those things? I think one way is to follow these five principles, which are whole, wild, wet, <laughs> slow, and bold. Right? And so what do those things mean? So that's what I'm going to go through while showing you how to make a loaf of bread. So there are handouts here. Just do me a favor. Don't get too caught up in them throughout this presentation. I'm, going to, I'm not going to really follow that. That stands on its own. You can, you can follow that at home. It has exact quantities of all the ingredients and everything. Mostly what I, what I want to try to get out of this is just some, some helpful tidbits that you can, will inspire you to actually give it a shot, because it's really not that hard. Um, so whole, whole grain. Let's see. So at the mill, we have, and lots of people don't actually realize this, but we have a mill, which is the namesake <laughs> of the place. Um, and so it's a stone mill, and we use that mill to freshly mill all of our whole grain flour. Um, and my mind is constantly being blown by the variety of grains that you can use for bread making. And so today I just brought two different whole grain stone ground flours. Uh, this is Sonora flour, which is a variety that has a really rich history here in California. Um, it's grown about two hours northeast of the bakery. Um, I'll pass it around. It's really light in color, mild in flavor. Let me just pass it around. And so that is a type of white wheat. And here in this big bag, which is what I'm going to use to mix up a little bit of dough, is some red wheat. And so there's many different types of wheat. Red wheat and white wheat are just categories. You've probably heard of spelt, of kamut, of emmer, of durum, of rye. Rye is not wheat, but it is a grain from which you can make totally delicious bread, which is one of the breads that you'll all be eating today. Um, the other bread that you'll try is, is the bread made from that Sonora, which we call California heirloom. Um, so most bread is made from white flour. And what I mean by that is white flour is what you get if you take powdered wheat berries. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. And you take out the wheat bran and the wheat germ. Okay, and so when you take those things out, you have a pretty shelf-stable product. And you have a product that's not as good for you and doesn't actually taste as good. Doesn't definitely doesn't taste as as strongly. There aren't as many flavors that are in there. Um, I prefer bread that's made with mostly whole grain. Again, I'm not knocking white flour. We use a bunch of it at the bakery. You can make really sweet, airy loaves of bread. 
I just think if we're trying to make bread that is really nutritive and can be the cornerstone of a healthy diet, you need a lot of whole grains in there. Um, so the recipe that you all have there is for 100% whole wheat bread. There's also a few notes in there that if you want to add some bread flour, lighten it up, uh, you can totally do that, no problem. Uh, do I want to accept questions as we go, or should I just blast? Well, we can, but I think best it'll be to go through and then okay. we can accept questions right at the end cool. so that the presentation goes smooth. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Don't derail me with any hard questions. Don't worry. We got okay, you. so that's whole in a nutshell. Next up, wild. What I mean by wild is wild yeast, sourdough. So we make all sourdough bread at the mill. We don't make necessarily sour tasting bread. Sourdough is just a culture of wild yeast and bacteria in flour and water. And it's wild. It's the ambient yeast that are present on the grain, in the bakery, in the air, in your aura. Um, and you use that to make your bread rise, to give it amazing flavors, to help it keep well. Um, totally delicious breads can be made from commercial yeast, yeast that's made in a factory that you can buy in a store. Um, you just, you can only use a little bit, because if you use too much, it ferments too quickly, great flavors don't develop, the bread's going to stale really quickly. Um, we use all sourdough, it makes bread that's more digestible. And it's really, it adds a layer of complexity to the process. Um, but I think it's really worth it. And in the bakery, what we actually do, um, and this may confuse some of you, but it also may really simplify it for some of you, is we actually, for most of our breads, we don't even have a separate sourdough starter that we use. We actually just use some dough. So we, so on today, we're mixing our dough. My bakers are back in the bakery right now mixing dough. And they're going to take a bunch of that dough, and they're just going to put it in the fridge till tomorrow. And then they'll mix that into that day's bread dough. And it's all the same thing. It's all flour and water, salt, wild yeast, bacteria. Yeah. So obviously, you can't do that. Well. My guess is you can't do that at home because you're probably not baking bread every day. Um, so it's a little bit more practical to have a sourdough starter that you maintain on its own. And so when you're starting the life of a loaf of bread, and to, to feed your starter, so simple. So, so, so simple. You throw out most of it, compost it. And trust me, you want to compost it because if you don't compost it, because what I used to do was I was like, I can't compost, I can't throw it out. It's my little pet. I didn't, that pains me. And so I would just bake with it. And then you end up in my position. OK? So, <laughs> um, so you just take a little bit of it. Let's see here. Yeah. Don't worry about the exact quantity. Oh, yeah. Move this? Yeah. Um, Also, some, some folks, I think, are really intimidated by using a scale. If you are interested in bread baking, getting a scale is going to so drastically simplify your life, especially in the early phases, because you don't have that judgment to know, um, oh, the dough's a little bit too wet. Oh, the dough's a little bit too dry. And if you're measuring by volume, a cup of flour there's a huge range in how much flour actually fits in a cup. And so because you're not able to say, oh, shoot, I should add a little bit more water because I compacted the flour in the cup, um, it just kind of slows your learning process. Whereas if you use a scale, you know exactly how much of everything you've added, and it's, it's a breeze. So I, honestly, I didn't even use a scale for the first six, eight months. I was baking, obviously you can do it. There's plenty of great recipes out there, but I think it's really helpful. So we put in a little bit of sourdough starter.
Now, Josie, where can uh, we buy a starter, uh, sourdough starter? So you can actually make your own sourdough starter yourself. It's super simple. You just mix together flour and water and you let it sit for a day. You throw out most of it. You do it again. And um, if you use whole grain rye flour, you're going to have a better chance of having success with that. Um, and you basically just do that for two weeks or so and you should have a healthy starter. Um, okay. You can visit a bakery, see if they'll they'll part with with some of it. Um, gonna pour in a little bit of water, a little more. I'm just winging it here. Don't pay attention to the quantities. I'm just showing you the uh, the basic process. Um, I'm gonna break up the starter. And so another thing that. I think is really intimidating when you're first learning how to bake is how, how to fit it into your life, right? You're all at work right now. You can't be like doing this like hours long, hey, hours long process. Um, but it's actually really easy to fit it into your life. And the way to do that is to use, um, to use the fridge. And you basically can do any of, these, any of these phases of the process, stick the dough in the fridge, and then just get to it when you're home from work or when you woke up or when you're back from your camping trip. It's, it's really actually very flexible. OK. And now, a little bit of this whole grain flour. Could I get um, just a spoon, a wooden spoon? Thank you. Yeah, and all I'm going to show you here is about what the consistency should look like. Yeah, that's my hope is to give you just some sort of some landmarks, some signposts along the way. So you can say, oh yeah, this kind of looks like what he did. This is just one way of making bread though. There's many different ways. Again, so you see how I'm, I'm relying on my judgment here. Um, if you have a scale, you just pour in, oh god, I keep doing that. <laughs> If you have a scale, you just pour in the exact amount, and you don't worry about it. OK, so something like that. Can we see this? Yeah, it's kind of like a thick pancake batter. Yeah, and at about this consistency, with about that much starter, this is going to be good to go for, uh, you let it sit for 8 to 12 hours at room temperature. Yeah? So that's a nice number, right? It's about how long you're at work, somewhere in there about how long <laughs> you're sleeping. <laughs> um, and you'll come back to it, and it will be, it'll, it'll have all sorts of bubbles on the surface. It'll look like it's really alive. And that's great. That's what you want. You're sort of getting this, this is like a pre-dough. Yeah? You're getting this ready to mix into your bread dough. But it's just the same thing. It's a little bit of starter, flour, water. And so we're just going to do that again, right? So we're going to fast forward 8 to 12 hours. This is smelling nice. You can see bubbles, yeah? <clears throat> and so that brings me to the third principle, which is wet, wet dough, yeah? So most bread dough, it's just not made with enough water, right? And it's made not with enough water because it's really easy to handle stiff, stiff bread dough, right? So lots of, if any of you have made bread or you've seen people make bread before, um, they mix the dough and then if they're doing it by hand, they put it out on the counter and they, they use some flour and they rub it around and push it. And we're not going to actually do any of that. We're going to leave it in the bowl the whole time and we're just going to use water to have it not stick to things. I think that especially with whole grain flours, whole grain breads, it just needs more water. You've got that brand in German there. It's going to soak up more water. Um, that's going to lead to better texture in your bread, better flavors in your bread, and better keeping quality, right? It starts out with more water. It's going to retain more water over time. Um, some people say high hydration, high hydration doughs. Um, 
I've started saying fully hydrated does or properly hydrated does because high hydration um, is not, it kind of misses the point depending on what grain you're working with. Because some grains, every, every grain has a different absorption. Yeah, and so like that Sonora, that light colored flour and the bread that we're gonna eat, that particular crop is super absorbent. It absorbs, you know, 30% more water than another grain that we work with. Um, but we also make this bread, it's probably my favorite bread that I unfortunately don't have today because, because the grain ran out. Uh, einkorn bread. That bread absorbs, um, the einkorn absorbs 75 grams of water for every 100 grams of flour. That Sonora absorbs 110 grams of water for every 100 grams of flour. So a huge difference, right? So calling the einkorn high hydration, it's a little, little misleading. Anyway, so we're gonna put water in, yeah? And we're just gonna disperse your sourdough pre-ferment here. Just get it dissolved in there. And when you're doing this at home, you're paying really close attention to the numbers here, yeah? <laughs> right? <clears throat> you're gonna add some more whole wheat flour. And this really, this is, this is exactly the same process we do at the bakery, just obviously on a much smaller scale, but this is it. The, the thing that makes it tricky is that, and you'll, you'll learn this, which is what makes bread baking infinitely challenging and fulfilling and intriguing is that every day, especially if you're working with a sourdough culture, Every day, things are a little bit different. And so you have to really be tuned into the dough. Yeah, and so this would be a really wet dough. I'm gonna add a little bit more. And again, when you're starting out, it's okay to go a to add a little bit more flour just to make things easier to handle because it can be kind of a bummer if you, uh, you're going through the process of making your loaf of bread, you're all excited, you got your friends coming over for dinner the next night, I'm baking bread for the party. <laughs> and uh, you get to the shaping phase of bread baking and you screw it all up, um, which, which I've done many times. So you're using water to, uh, to shape rather than flour. Yes, well, I'm going to use flour to do the final shape in a okay. little bit. But, but yeah, I'm just trying to not, I'm trying to keep the ratio of, of flour and water okay. in that sweet spot. And if anything, I go a little bit on the wet side. Okay. Yeah. So while you're working, is it okay to ask you a couple questions? Of course, man. Okay, so for the bunch of us who um, shop at regular grocery stores. What kind of flour yeah. do you recommend we get? Uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, some really nice options that are that are local, like Justos, um, Central Milling is a company up in Petaluma. I don't think their flour is is super easy to find in grocery stores, but like I for for the first year or so, I would go to Rainbow Grocery in San Francisco and just like load up my backpack <laughs> with like, you know, I'd like stand in the bulk bin, like filling up sacks of, of flour, <laughs> um, which I think they use juice doughs. Um, okay. King Arthur flour is something that's really widely available. It's a great, great flour company out of Vermont. All right. Um, yeah. Super. Yeah, All Bob's right. Red Mill's awesome. Okay, Do here's this. Sell flour at the mill? We also sell flour at the mill, Sorry. yeah. Cool, I got it. No. Can you repeat it? He's wondering about with your starter, what kind of flour do you have to use? Yeah, you have to use the same. And no, you don't. So, so like e even this starter that I brought, because 
We don't use a starter for most of our breads. Um, we don't use a starter that we like keep separate from most of our breads because we do that old dough method. But this is actually a rye starter because we do keep a starter for our rye bread because we don't make it every single day. But so this was whole grain rye flour and then I just added whole wheat flour. Just something to consider is that whatever flour you use for your starter, that's, that flour is going to then be in your final loaf of bread, right? So if you don't mind a little bit of rye, no problem. Yeah. All right. Um, I forgot one thing in this. Who can tell me what it is? Salt. <laughs> it is a rite of passage. It's a rite of passage in, in the life of a baker to forget the salt. <laughs> um, which at home, it's, uh, you're, you're very disappointed in yourself when it happens. Um, in a bakery where we're making 350 loaves, uh, there, you've got a few people that are very disappointed in you. But, um, but really, it's, uh, you usually can, can find a way to make it work. Because basically what, what you then have is uh, a starter, you know? Um, but you're going to be mixing it again. Because if you don't add the salt, um, the dough is going to ferment a lot faster. Because the salt actually slows the fermentation. It also helps bring out the flavors of the grain. But you'll know before you bake it off, because the dough will be behaving differently than usual. Do you need more fermentation? Say it one more time. Do you use any sugar for fermentation? No. No. So it works without, without sugar. Yeah, totally. Yeah, Some just. People think that you need the sugar to yeah, so there's lots of opinions out there on sourdough starters. Some people use, you know, pineapple juice. Some people use raisins. Um, I've had great experience using whole grain rye flour and water and nothing else. Um, that's not to say that in certain environments with certain flours, that might not be enough. I just haven't experienced it, nor have I experienced it from anybody I've directly talked with. Yeah, so I'm just going to fold that salt in. Just going to mush it in. Can you overmix at any point? The question is, can you overmix at any point? If you're mixing it in a machine mixer, who asked that? Yeah. If you're mixing in a machine mixer, you totally can. By hand, you don't really have to worry about it. Yeah, and, and the, this method that that uh, uh, I described in the handout and I'm showing you now, it's just all hand mix. Yeah, you're just getting the salt incorporated. It still is pretty sticky. Yes, it is. This, is. this would be on the stickier side. This is, you know, if you're, if you're feeling like being, being wild, you know, that would be fine. Probably would be a little bit tricky to deal with if you haven't handled much dough. Um, okay. Whole wild wet. Oh. Slow. Slow. Bold's the last thing. Um, <laughs> slow. So what I mean by that, slow fermentation, right? Most bread is made in a few hours from the time the flour and water, salt, yeast are mixed together um, to the point when it's baked. You can, you can pull, pull it off. Uh, on a time scale like that, but bread's really going to be better if you don't rush it, <laughs> right? And that's one of the things that I loved about baking from the very beginning was, was that it made me slow down and just, when the dough is fermenting, you can't, you can't do anything but wait. <laughs> And it's kind of it's kind of nice to to be engaged in a practice that requires you to engage in that waiting. Um, the way we do things at the mill is, you know, today we're mixing up bread dough with our starter, which is just yesterday's dough. Yeah, and this afternoon we'll shape it into bread loaves, and then we'll put it in the fridge and we'll bake it tomorrow morning. And so again, that fridge, if I could give you one little trick, it's like bread, bread baking can really easily fit into your life. Just use the fridge. I used to stick bread dough in the fridge all weekend long while I'd go out on a camping trip and I'd come back and I'd bake it off. Sometimes it was disgusting <laughs> and other times it was a lot better, right? And so that's where the subtlety 
comes in. How active was your starter, right? How long did you let it sit before you shaped it into a bread loaf? How long did it sit shaped in a bread loaf before you baked it off? Too much to get into, but um, if, you, if you start baking some bread, you'll, you'll pick up on those things. So you do what I just did to that. So we're not going to take it out and knead it on a flour-covered counter at all. We're going we're gonna to stretch it and fold it in the bowl about every half hour for a few hours. Yeah? Do that about four times. So you pull it, fold it back on itself. Fold it back on itself. And this is exactly what we do in the bakery. We just do it with big bus tubs of like 15 kilos of dough. Yeah? And so you're doing this, and you can tell already. See how the dough can stretch a little bit, right? It's not just like a lump of paste. We're developing the gluten. And we're developing the gluten without oxidizing the dough, which is what can happen if you mix it aggressively in a machine mixer. And that's not going to help you out with your flavors, the aromas, with your nutrition. Yeah, and just a little bit of flop, just a little bit of water. Yeah? And that's good. I leave that alone for a half hour. I go for a walk, I read a book, take a nap. <laughs> and after a few hours of that, again, if you want to go to bed or you want to go to work, just do that and stick it in the fridge. Just cover it up. And just get to it when you get to it. Is temperature important? Temperature is extremely important. I, again, when I was starting out, I didn't take temperature of anything for the first six, eight months. It leads to unpredictable results because that dough is a certain temperature, right? I just don't know what it is. If you know what it is, then you can control things. Yeah, you can say, like in the bakery, like, we want this dough to be ready to divide in three hours. We, we adjust the water temperature to an exact degree in order to ensure that that fermentation proceeds at the schedule we want. Basically, the rule of thumb is faster, uh, warmer temperatures make things happen faster. Okay. Cooler temperatures slow things down. I'm going to divide this dough. So this is some dough that was mixed up this morning. Can I work over here? Is this OK? Yeah. Slow <laughs> fermentation. Yeah. I'm wondering why do you take that half hour break between again? Yeah. Yeah, so in order to fully develop the the gluten with this method, you need to let the dough relax, right? Because if you do it, you'll you'll feel it. If you if you do it too much, you'll just start tearing the dough. Yeah? So you slow down and you let some fermentation occur, which also helps strengthen the gluten. Yeah. Ah, it's sticky. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a little sticky, and I sort of cut some corners on this. We'll see if we can make it work. So again, um, I'm just using a little bit of water so that it doesn't stick. And so now I'm going to pre-shape the dough, which is just making it into a round. <laughs> just do that. <laughs> No, when I when I was first learning how to do this, um, I actually used to do it. I used to do it in the air in my hands, and that's because I was doing it at home, and I didn't have enough bench space on my kitchen counter to do it. There's lots of ways to do this. We do it this way so that we don't incorporate more flour, because at this point, so this dough has just completed its bulk fermentation, its first fermentation. So all that flour has been mixed with water, and it's fermented. If we incorporate more flour now, it's not going to have the opportunity to ferment. Okay. This is um, this can be tricky if you haven't done this much before, um, but it's it's I think a little less important than the final shape. 
which I'm going to show you how to do right afterwards. I'm about to run out of time, which is <laughs> perfect. Yeah? Okay, so there's that. And now we're gonna introduce just a little bit of flour. And we usually do this with bread flour, but you can totally do it with whole grain flour. Where's that Sonora? Is it? Is anyone? Sonora. Yeah, cool. There we go. Great. Okay, so I'll just do one of these, and then I'll talk you through the bake real quickly. Yeah? Which is the last principle, bold. Okay, so we, we put flour on top, yeah, and you can tell it's not, not sticking. We've got a little flour on the surface here. So I'm gonna flip it on its head. And so we're gonna, just watch, watch, watch what I do here. We're gonna fold the bottom up, two thirds, three quarters, so. Then we're gonna do the same thing on the other side. Yeah, then we're gonna spin it. Nice little package, right? It's a little bit tapered on the top. Take this top, fold it down. Then just fold it over again. And then I'll change this so you can see. So here's the seam here. So you're just gonna use the palm of your hand. Seam it up. Yeah. And then we're gonna put this in rice flour. And the rice flour just helps it not stick to the basket. You can also totally just put this in a, in a pan then you don't need to deal with the rice flour. Yeah? And then you let that sit. You can stick it in your fridge. And just get to it when you get to it. Or you can let it sit out for three, four hours. And then bake it. And for the bake, what you want to do is preheat your oven. 450. If you're baking a loaf like this, a freeform hearth loaf, you want to have a baking stone in there. And then, this is, I just can't help but show you this part. You're going to preheat that baking stone for 20, 20, 30 minutes. And then you're going to take your loaf and sprinkle the top with some flour. Or you can use some parchment paper as well. And now we're, we're jumping ahead in the process, right? This is, you will have had to have waited a few hours or overnight or after a day at work. And you're gonna flip it out. It'll look prettier than this. And then you take your razor or lom this is a double-sided razor, very thin, very sharp, and you're going to slash this sucker, all right? And this can be, this is very, this is very exciting when you, it's still very exciting for me still doing it after all these years, but uh, it'll be very exciting for you. And there's, it's a very subtle art, but it encourages you to really, really tune in to this bread dough and Voila! <laughs> and so you bake for 20 minutes um, with a metal pot. So you take this, slide it onto the hot baking stone, put a metal pot on top, wait 20 minutes, take the metal pot off, and at that point the loaf will have totally transformed, it will have increased in volume, probably won't have changed color very much because it's been baking in a steam saturated environment. But then when you take that top off and you let it finish its bake in a dry environment, that's where all that delicious caramelization is gonna occur. And we, I, I 
favor, encourage, prefer a bold bake. It's that fifth principle there. Lots of people, if they haven't had our bread before, they say, well, you know, like this, I th thought, heard this place was great and they burned all the bread. <laughs> but no, we do it on purpose because we think it tastes the best. It creates the um, most delicious variation and texture between the moist interior and a crunchy exterior. Um, and yeah, pushing it up to just shy of burnt is really what, what I prefer. And I think that about covers it. Cool, that's time. fantastic. Yeah. Perfect. Are you open to taking questions now? Of course, yeah. Does anybody have questions in the group? Uh, we have a microphone. For the uh, metal pot technique you suggested, do you yeah. preheat the pot before? The question is for the metal pot cooking, do you preheat the pot? Yeah, you, you don't have to. I've done, it, um, I've done it both ways. And if you have a thin-walled metal pot, really mostly what the metal pot is doing is trapping the steam. Another way, which is, which is also totally awesome, is to do you know, a Dutch oven or a Le Creuset. Um, and that makes the heat blast it from, from all directions, and it traps the steam. That can be a little bit the transfer of your unbaked loaf into the Le Creuset or the Dutch oven can be really tricky. And I've like screwed up many a loaf doing that, whereas the baking stone, it's flat. And so you just slide it on, take that room temperature metal pot, put it on top, and you're good to go. Cool. Any other question. questions? Um, if you're doing the method using the sourdough, just the dough, yeah. at what point in the process would that be the dough that you use and how would it differ in the new bread making process? It kind of depends. It depends on the activity level of your dough, the temperature of your fridge, all that stuff. What we do is we take our dough, our whole wheat dough, immediately after we're done mixing it. And so it actually has salt in it as well. And we, we then have to divide it up into smaller bits so that it can cool down quickly, right? Because if we took 30 kilos of dough and put it in the fridge, it would take a long time to cool down. So we break it up into little bits and put it right into the fridge and then use it 20 hours later. So, say it again? No, no, yeah. And so, and you can do that, it's really, you know, every once in a while if we screw up and like accidentally throw, up, throw away a, uh, our starter or our old dough, you can actually just take unbaked bread loaves. Like you could take any of these and use these as a starter. Because it's all the same thing. It's flour, water, that wild yeast and bacteria. The, the art of it is catching it, is catching your dough at the right phase in its development after that fact, right? And I mean, obviously that affects, like the development of this dough is, it's, it's pretty young to be used as a starter for another dough, which is why we stick it in the fridge and let it sit there for a while. Yeah. Hi, sure. um, I was reading Michael Pollan's Cooked, yeah. and in the bread section, from what I understand, the whole like milling industry is really built around white flour. Yeah. And wheat flour that we buy in the store is really just white flour with the germ and the bran added back in afterwards. So totally. where can like we home cooks get true wheat flour? You can get it at the mill. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can get it at the mill. You can get it um, from. You know, it's a good question. I don't know of exactly which large mills um, reliably produce whole grain flour that hasn't been separated and then reconstituted. It's a very common practice. Um, you know, another surefire way, which is, is pretty impractical for most home bakers, but is to mill, mill your own flour. Um, um, yeah, I can't, I can't actually give a an answer that I'm totally positive about on that front. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I had two questions. Uh, one was um, with uh, when, when you let your bread sit or when you let your dough sit for a little bit, yeah. um, 
like in in the past, like when I've let that happen, it, it kind of gets a bit of a skin or like a kind of dry skin on sure. it. Is that just because I haven't incorporated enough water in my dough, or would that happen with with your technique or your recipes as well? At which phase in the process? Uh, at, like at the end of proofing. When you've shaped it into a loaf. Yeah. Yeah. So that happens because the moisture in the dough has, is evaporating off of the surface, right? And you're forming a little skin. It's usually not a big deal. That happens sometimes in the bakery. A, a, a little skin, a little skin on the, you know, when you've got your loaf in your basket, a little skin on, on this side can actually be really helpful because it makes the transfer into the oven a lot easier. Um, but one thing you can do, you know, this depends on the airflow in your fridge or wherever your dough, your dough is sitting, but you can cover it up. You can put this inside of a plastic bag tie the end, you could put it inside of a container like this. I noticed really big differences in the fridge that I had uh, based on where I put it in the fridge, right? Some areas are gonna have a lot more airflow than others. So you want it in a sort of calm, draft-free environment. Yeah. And, and is, is the steam pot or the steam pot or the pot with the steaming technique thing, is that enough to, to give it like a good crust? Because I know some recipes will say like spritz your oven with water to create a steam oven first. Yeah. So I've done, I've done a lot of home oven baking. The oven that I was baking in at home when I started selling my bread was not a fancy oven at all. It was in a little, little apartment in the Mission, gas-fired oven. Um, and for a long time, because I was baking 12 loaves at once, I couldn't bake them all on baking stones with pots on top. I would do, I'd throw boiling water in the bottom of the oven, which helps, <laughs> which helps create a steam saturated environment. The problem is that your oven is designed to let steam escape. So unless you trap it in there, it's not gonna be as good. So doing the oven within an oven, whether that's with a Dutch oven, a Le Creuset, or a, a baking stone and a pot on top, you can make bread that's as good as any professional bakery. You really can. The only difference is that the professional bakery can make hundreds, thousands of loaves, right? But if you have to make one loaf, your home oven is totally capable. Uh, what are your views on the gluten-free movement? Hmm. <laughs> good question. Um, well, I think it's I think it's great that people are exploring different things to help them feel better about themselves. Um, and I think for some people, eating, eating less of particular types of food makes them feel better. And that's awesome, whatever, whatever it is. <clears throat> I think what we're seeing now with gluten and bread and wheat is is actually really amazing because it's raising the awareness about how bread is made, how wheat is grown. Um, and I think what practically everybody who actually explores that question is gonna find is that it's, it's actually not gluten, it's not wheat, it's not bread, it's certain types of those things. Yeah, so I don't think the question is, can I eat bread? It's, it's what type of bread can I eat? If you want to eat bread, if you don't want to eat bread, then by all means, don't eat it. Also, some people have celiac disease, and they have a very serious reaction to gluten, and I'm not questioning that at all. But there is, um, you know, it's, it's a fad right now, and I've been really encouraged by every, single person who's written me an email or come into the mill and said, hey, I haven't eaten bread in a while, but I hear that you have some bread that actually doesn't bother people who are allergic or who are sensitive to wheat or to grain or to bread, and they eat our bread, and it doesn't bother them at all. And why is that? Because the way that we make bread and the way that I just taught you how to make bread is totally different than the way that most bread is made which is made on a really large scale in a really short amount of time with ingredients that are mass produced and nutrition is, is not really on the radar, right? Or it's kind of an after fact and it's sort of pumped into it 
in weird forms. <laughs> yeah. So, is that, yeah. We make a gluten-free bread, though, at the mill, and for people who, who do have a really serious sensitivity to, to gluten and to wheat, um, you know, they, they love that we offer that, and uh, I'm really proud to offer that. Thanks. Yes, sir. So could, you, could you comment on the trade-off in the texture and flavor of the, of the ultimate bread between the folding and kneading every half hour that you demonstrated and yeah. a no-knead method where you're re uh, relying strictly upon time and fermentation to develop the texture? Yeah. So no-knead... For those of you who don't know, is a t totally awesome technique that was popularized. Um, uh, there was an article in the New York Times uh, with Mark Bittman and Jim Leahy from Sullivan Street Bakery. He's a really talented guy. Um, and you can make an incredible loaf of bread in your home oven with very little work. You don't need it at all. You just mix together the flour, water, salt, a little bit of yeast. You let it sit for a long time, sort of flop it into a round shape, let it sit for a little bit, bake it off. Um, I've tried that method with more whole grain flours and haven't, haven't had quite as much luck with it. I think that it's an amazing method if you use primarily uh, white flour. So if you're gonna use that method, um, I think you'll have the best luck if you use you use mostly white flour. Um, I'm open to hearing other experiences. That just hasn't been my experience. Um, but that's also not a sourdough bread. Yeah? And so with the sourdough fermentation, you you have to expel expel a little bit put a little bit more energy into the bread dough in order to develop that gluten um, and have the type of fermentation that it's going to lead to a to a delicious loaf of bread rather than um, than just leaving it alone completely well, thank you we have time for one more question and I believe the microphone is right there hi I was wondering if you could talk a little bit from an entrepreneurial standpoint what your journey was like from you know I had this idea to bake bread and sell it to I now have a mill and a bakery and yeah. I sell bread and also what do you do with the bread that you don't sell at the end of the day yeah yeah it's been it's been a pretty quick journey um, and now you know I think most of my energy is um, is really spent on sort of big picture stuff and uh, the relationships that that exist both within my business and with my businesses and other businesses and our, and our customers and stuff. So so I, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about um, about those relationships, uh, which was a surprise to me. You know, I didn't I, I didn't I had no idea that I would spend as much time, you know, on my computer and in conversation with people uh, when I decided I was going to be a baker. Um, but it's been, I think it was, it was a bit of a work to my benefit how little I knew. Because um, cause I just, I just kind of made things up as I went. And I didn't totally know how difficult it was going to be. Um, just wrap it up and then I said yes to things over and over again. And, um, you know, I still sort of am surprised when I look back on the last few years and how much my day-to-day -day life has changed and how, how the business has grown. Um, but, yeah, I'm really fortunate to be able to say that, that I, um, you know, work with an amazing group of passionate, talented people and um, they make they make the the best bread that that uh, that we know how to make. So does that kind of answer your question? Cool. <laughs> All right. Thank you. This was an amazing class. Thank and you. It was really great learning from you. So, Josie Baker, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.